My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The word of the Lord. As Irving mentioned earlier, we are starting a new series today entitled Strong Bonds. Uh, if you're hoping for something more romantic, come back next week. We're going to talk about strong bonds in our marriage relationships and in romantic relationships. And we'll talk about families the week after that. Uh, also coming up, a sneak preview for you. Uh, we're going to talk about this next week. But on Sunday the 17th. Uh, the Sunday after Valentine's Day, we have an opportunity for all of you who'd like to be here to renew your vows and recommit ourselves to our spouses. So we invite you to be here that week uh, for Sunday the 17th. We'll talk more about that next week in our message. But for today, we are starting off in honor of the Super Bowl, or the big game, as we're legally allowed to say. Or you have to pay to say Super Bowl, you know that? Uh, the big game is today, and so we are focusing on teams and how important teams are in our life. Most of us are on a team of some kind. I hope that you are. And if not, I hope by the end of our message, by the end of today, you will think about the fact that you are on a team and recognize your teammates surrounding you. Uh, but as you think about living as a team, we start off with Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is rightly called one of the wisdom books in the Old Testament. So if you're ready for some wisdom here from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. It says this, if one of them falls down, one can help the other up. Uh, it says, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them get up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one alone keep warm? Though one may be overpowered, two can actually defend themselves against an attack. And then it says this, even better than two, it says a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There is strength in numbers. That's the Reader's Digest version of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Did you know that? That's the Reader's Digest version. There is strength in numbers. And so as we think about the, the Super Bowl today, we're reminded that even though a lot of our athletes and in our modern world we tend to have a, a lot of machismo and a lot of solo ideas about ourselves, the reality is we are not that strong by ourselves. Just recently, Patrick Mahomes from the Kansas City Chiefs, and I thought as I lost his picture somewhere, he was uh, rewarded MVP of the league, even though his team lost their championship game. I had never heard of this guy before, never seen him play, and uh, my son was watching the highlight reel, and I saw this amazing play in which he as a quarterback was tackled by somebody who came through the line. He brushed the tackle off, and then he threw a completed pass. That's an incredible guy. And he ruined my whole point about how a quarterback is no good without a line keeping the, the defense away from them. And I thought, oh man. And then I read his comment, his quote, when he was announced to be the MVP. Here's his quote. He says, yeah, he says, I mean, it's awesome. He says, I got put into a great situation, he said. I got to learn behind a great quarterback, Alex Smith. I got to be on a team with a lot of playmakers who helped me excel in my game and make me look really good on a daily basis. That is an amazing amount of humility for a professional football player who just was awarded MVP of the league. And even after that amazing play where he got tackled and still made the pass, he recognizes that he is nothing without his team. The teamwork is important for him. Or maybe you're more of a fan of individual sports because you like the Lone Ranger type. Well, I have a picture, I do have a picture here of Phil Mickelson. He's a pretty famous guy if you happen to watch uh, golf ever. 
He's a pretty famous guy. Now, he's not with this guy anymore, but the next slide has a picture of him and his 25-year caddy. You check this out. Uh, Jim Bones McKay. They uh, broke up their partnership a couple years ago, but for 25 years, that was his caddy. That was his right-hand man. He has a lot of other people on his team advising him and, and helping him to learn and to train as well. But even that, which seems like a pretty individualized sport, is not, in fact, an individual sport. It's actually a team sport. Up next, we have another famous guy. His name is Dale Earnhardt Jr. Somewhat famous, right? Almost as famous as his father. We think of him as being a race car driver. Seems like a solo sport. Right, next picture is of him and his crew chief, uh, Steve Letart, I'm not even trying to pronounce his name, Letart, I think. Uh, and are reminded that even things that seem like solo sports are actually team sports. Our own Derek Johnson is not here to this morning because he is out racing trucks in the desert and he does not drive them. His cousin drives them and his cousin recruited him to be his co-driver. After a little bit of research, they discovered that racing is 80% co-driver, 20% guy who touches the pedals and holds the steering wheel. Isn't that interesting? All these things we think of as being lone ranger activities actually require a team. Seems that the Old Testament is pretty wise after all, that two are better than one. And as a matter of fact, three is even better than that. The implication is this. We all live on teams. And if you don't have a team in your life, then you need to get one really fast. And the wonderful news for us is that God has given us a team around us. That's going to be our focus for the rest of this morning is to realize that God has designed us as a collection of his people to live as a team. I feel like we're going through our church's value statements here because one of them is doing life as a spiritual team. That's one of our values but for a team to work, whether well, it's an application, not just here at church, but hopefully has application in your families, as we talked about in a couple of weeks, has application at work, has application in our lives, anything we're doing together. And the first one is this. A team has a common goal. Now, I know if you're on a, um, a, a football team like this afternoon, or if you're on a little league team like we're got it coming up here, uh, that maybe it's pretty obvious what the goal is, right? Not, not Dale, Jr., Dale Earnhardt Jr., but his father, Dale Earnhardt, when he broke into stock car racing, in his second season, he had a new team, he had a new crew chief, and they had a very simple slogan for their team. Just two words. Can you guess what it is? Go fast. Just win. <laughs> that was their amazing strategy for their second season. Just win as many races as possible, if not place as high as possible. And with that complicated strategy, they won the points leader for that season. With their complicated strategy, just win. Right? So a, a team needs a common goal. Otherwise, they're going to be going in all kinds of different directions. And, you know, in the case of a Super Bowl team or a, a stock car racer or even a professional golfer, the goal is somewhat obvious, right? Now, there may be sub-goals, but the goal is pretty obvious. The difficulty is that in the other teams of our life, the goal may not be all that obvious. It may be more difficult for us to figure out what that is. There's a great uh, book on management that talks about the four disciplines of execution. It says one of them is to clarify what a win is. For your team, what does that mean for you to win? Well, let's turn to uh, John chapter 17, a little bit earlier in the chapter than our reading we had. It says this. And by the way, John chapter 17, this is a key chapter. It's time for our ears to perk up if you're reading through the book of John and get this chapter because this takes place. After Jesus had his last supper with his disciples, John chapter 17 all takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. Is Jesus praying right before he is arrested and put on trial and then gives his life for us? This is sort of like his last will and testament. So let's listen in to this amazing conversation between Jesus and his Father in heaven. He says, Father, the hour has come. The day I came to earth for is upon us. I'm about to do the good stuff. He says, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you gave to him. That's the goal for the team of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That is the goal, is to give eternal life. Now Jesus clarifies. He says, now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. Jesus and his Father were in agreement on what the goal was. The goal was for Jesus to give his life for the world and then for the whole world to hear that amazing news. That was the goal. That's the goal God has given to us as his team. That's the goal God has given to Mission India, is to go take to those 400 million people who have never even heard the name Jesus before, that they might hear that name and have an opportunity to respond to the incredible news that God himself came down from heaven lived his life here for us, and then gave it. We might live with him forever. See, by definition, a team is gathered for a goal. But the question for many teams is, what exactly is the goal? It's not always as clear as a touchdown or a Super Bowl ring. But it's equally as powerful once the goal is recognized. Our friends from Mission India have created a great book. And uh, the book is entitled, Measuring What Matters. It's a book about clarifying. What exactly do we mean when we say that Edgewater has, has won? You know, what does a touchdown look like for us? It's a great book and it challenges us. I think, is it the classic three Bs of the church? Which, pardon my language here, but it's butts, bucks, and buildings. Is the classic three Bs of church uh, goal. It's uh, butts and seats. Bucks in the plate and buildings around us? Or is it instead something that's maybe a bit more aligned with what we hear from Jesus and his Father? Is it people being engaged with that incredible word? Is it our community hearing that God is there for them? That God loves and cares for them? Is it people far away in countries around the world hearing that God came for them? And his people have joined that goal and that mission and are there to share that incredible word. It's maybe a different scorecard for us. Our touchdown might be how many people show up to volunteer for our events in our community? How many new people have heard the word of God and believe it and know that, that is life-changing for them? That there is a God who loves and cares about them. Maybe they have experience, as you saw in the India video, maybe they have been baptized and they have received that amazing name on their forehead and over their heart. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, God's people built a temple. And God told them, over the front of the temple, they're supposed to write his name. And he gave them this command. He said, wherever my name is, there I am going to live. Fast forward to the New Testament. And Jesus tells us to baptize people with his name on us. And we have the name of Jesus on our forehead, which means that Jesus has decided to live within us. It's not a place we go, but he goes with us. Incredible. And how powerful that is for us if we can rally around the goal. Maybe you experience that at work. Maybe you're not the leader of the team. Maybe you're the newest member on the team. Maybe you look around and you go, what are we doing? Does anybody even know? And maybe don't ask like that, but ask in a much kinder, gentler way, hey, what's our goal? You know, what, what are we trying to strive for? What do you really want me to do? It provides clarity. And it also begins to pull the team together as we have figured out what it is that we are striving for. Which brings us to our next point. Teams need trust. You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says to the Father, if there is some other way then the cross, let's do that. And then he says something powerful. He says, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus trusted the Father to know that he knew the right thing to do. And it's powerful us as we live in a team. Maybe it's just a team in our house. Maybe it's people we work with. Maybe it's here as a church. It's powerful for us to have trust in one another. Philippians chapter 2 says this. He says, let nothing be done out of, through strife or vain glory, he says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. 
Look not every man for his own things, but everyone also after the things of others. It's not a team if we're all looking out for numero uno. It's only a team if we're more interested in looking out for each other than looking out for ourselves. That's what a team does. All right, when I was a kid growing up, my dad was a huge basketball fan. Uh, that was the, the era of the kind of the solo players. You know, Magic Johnson was playing then. Uh, Larry Bird was playing then. He's actually a pretty good team player. Uh, but there were a lot of other famous superstars who were kind of ball hogs. And it really didn't matter that much who else was on the court with them. It was pretty much just the one-hit wonder. You know, they were the, the big shot, and they did everything. But that didn't last once the talent level in general started to rise in the league. And players had to shift and become a little bit more team players. They couldn't just be looking out for themselves. But it's important to be able to trust one another. People talk about team building exercises. You know the purpose, the goal of every team building exercise? Is to build trust in the team. Maybe you've seen the trust fall. I won't demonstrate it for you. But maybe you've seen it. Right? Maybe you trust your friends enough to catch you when you fall. Those are all about building trust in one another. How can we do that? When we put the team first, we build trust in each other. When we show up and we strive hard at whatever we're doing, right, we show other people they can trust us. The Bible talks about not being unequally yoked. And that's a challenge in a team. If you're on a team and somebody is underperforming, right, you lack trust in them. But something uh, my coach shared with me is that if one person on the team starts to overperform, the others naturally tend to underperform. Right? So we need to continually call each other up to match one another's intensity so we can trust each other. So we empower each other rather than enabling others to slough off. I've had a lot of fun watching this with my kids since they're getting old enough now in school to the age of the group project. <laughs> right, you remind them. You know, that's part of the challenge. The group projects learn how to work as a team, not as one person does it and everybody else signs it. One person stays up all night and everybody else goofs off. That's not the idea, right? We want all the partners on the team to be performing together. A big piece of that for us is to just do our own part and then also have the strength to remind others keep them accountable, that we need them to help as well. Next, we are reminded, the purpose of those things, the purpose of the common goal, the purpose of having trust in each other, is that we are all pulling in the same direction. That we're all pulling together. Here again, we hear this incredible prayer of Jesus for us. He says, this is my prayer is not just for the 12 disciples that he had while he was here on earth. He says, I pray also for those who are going to believe in me through their message. Notice something. Sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes our scorecard as God's people starts to look a little bit lean. Right in our video, we heard about the deceiver. The deceiver also has a scorecard, right? When people don't hear about Jesus, he's very excited. We want to build up our scorecard. We want people to hear about Jesus. But listen to this incredible word from Jesus here. Is he's worked with the 12 and actually about 72 different people in his lifetime here. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who, underline this, will believe in me through their message. That's a Jesus prayer for you. You've already heard the message. And Jesus is praying for people who haven't heard the message yet. And he says, through you, they're going to believe in him. Not because we're amazing or because we do such a great job or we have all the right answers, but because God is working through us. And he's going to show other people through our lives what he can do. And he believes that's going to happen. And then here's his prayer for us. That all of them may be one. He says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, when the world sees the body of Christ working as a team together, they believe in Jesus Christ. Because that is unworldly for people to actually work together as a team. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved 
me. That's incredible what Jesus says. He has faith in you, right? Jesus calls us to believe in him. He gives us faith and trust in him. But Jesus also trusts in you. That he has given you the power to share the wonderful news of him with other people. That's amazing. And how is that done? He says when people see the unity of his people, they're going to want to be a part of that. They're going to want to have that in their life as well. And we're reminded that in the world around us, there are a lot of unity destroyers. The devil, the deceiver, uses lots of tools to infiltrate our teams and try to break them apart. He tries to infiltrate our church and break it apart. He tries to make us think that the, the things in life that are defining or matter to us, right? maybe you're wearing a Patriots jersey today. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> maybe you're wearing a Rams jersey. You know, maybe you don't like the NFL, and so you're wearing a UCLA shirt or whatever it is, or, or just the nondescript football shirt. <laughs> the deceiver tries to make us think that those things we identify with are so powerful, we can't be around others who are against them. Maybe you've been on Facebook, or maybe you've watched the news, listened to the radio lately. Our world, our whole country seems to be in uproar and taking sides politically. I not those things aren't important, but many times the deceiver tries to tell us they are more important than the thing we have in common here, which is Christ. I pray there is room in this room, because there's certainly room in God's community, in God's kingdom, in his body of Christ, for people of all different persuasions of political or team affiliations. Because one thing is so strong that it binds them all together. And that is Jesus Christ. Point number four says this, team of rivals. I don't know if you're a Lincoln fan or not, but he was a pretty smart guy. And he brought together people of very different political opinions to accomplish something pretty amazing that has lasted to this very day. But he wasn't the first one to do it. He said, I think Jesus was the first one to bring together a team of rivals. Romans chapter 5 says this, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were on the other team of Jesus, Christ died for us. When Jesus made his way to the cross, there was a super small team raising the banner of Jesus. It was a team of about zero. It came 84 people. His best friend John and the three women who knew him best were the only ones who were at the cross with Jesus. You know, it wasn't just one disciple, Thomas, or probably uh, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas doubted him. It wasn't um, just Judas who abandoned Jesus. It was ten other disciples as well, even Peter. They all abandoned him, and yet Jesus gave his life for us. To show us that even our sins, even our inability to work together as a team, was not enough to separate us from him. The best team captain there ever was. And even on his team, Jesus had a team of rivals. Jesus had Peter, the zealot, who hated the Romans. And then he also had Matthew, the traitor, who collected taxes for the Romans. And Jesus got those two guys to hang out and to work together. That's pretty amazing. Don't you think? When you talk about opposite political parties, these guys had opposite national uh, affiliations. And yet they were together with Jesus because of that amazing power. Jesus brought those people together because he gave them something more powerful, more important than anything they had in life. He gave them eternal life because of his great love. Romans chapter 15 closes with this. It says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had, so that with one mind and with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our differences may be set aside, that we can learn to trust each other because God has entrusted himself to us. We can learn to forgive each other just like God has forgiven us in order that what might have been broken relationships, but might have been a destroyed team can instead be restored in Jesus Christ. Let's close the word of prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for the people you have given us around us in our life. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who has given his life for us. 
What does faith remind us? That indeed we are stronger together. Lord, I pray for our congregation. I pray that we would be a team of your people. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of your goal to impact the world with that incredible news of your son, Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, have us work towards that goal of sharing that wonderful news with people, and especially with children in our community and all around the world. In your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.